<laughs> okay. Um, thank you all very much for being here today. And it's a pleasure for me to share something about what I do with you. I am very passionate about it. And I thought it was going to be easy talking about it because I love to talk about it. And then I realized I was going to be talking to people who have no idea at all about uh, anesthesia or, or science, just to the general public. So I have to uh, break it down. And I think this is the hardest presentation I've had to do because I have to speak English and not medicine. <laughs> so I'm going to do my very best. I promise some people that I won't use any words that they don't understand. So what I'll do is uh, I thought about common things that people ask about anesthesia or anesthesiology. And I went, I wrote about these. So we'll go through what anesthesiology or anesthesia is, why you have to see an anesthesiologist before your surgery, which anesthetic technique will suit your operation? Um, will you come out of it alive or not? Will you feel, it, feel any pain after surgery? Do you need to give your consent for anesthesia? People know you have to consent to surgery, but um, do you have to consent to anesthesia as well? And what complications can you expect after surgery? So um, I see you were struggling with um, the word anesthesiologist. Um, you can have an anesthesiologist, you can have an anesthetist. Um, Americans say anesthesiology, British say anesthesia. But an anesthesiologist is somebody who must first be a doctor and then do an additional training and obtain certification in anesthesia. An anesthesiologist also is your, your physician when you have uh, comorbidities. Thanks to COVID, everybody knows the word comorbidities. You may have comorbidities uh, before, in addition to your surgical problem. So the anesthesiologist will take, has to be able to take care of those comorbidities. And then we uh, take care of pain and we also do critical care. So, uh, that is who an anesthesiologist is. An anesthetist will just give you your anesthetic and go away. They won't manage your comorbidities. They won't take, give you, be concerned about your pain relief. They won't be concerned about you in critical care. An anesthesiologist does all of that. So um, this is how we have evolved over time. Oh, can I shift this uh, distance from here? Yeah, okay. So um, the first anesthetic they say was given uh, to Adam when God put him in a deep sleep to take his rib to make, uh, to create, I won't say to make, to create Eve. And then women are more complex, you see. So you have to create the man and then first remove his rib, do something different to make the woman. And then after that, um, and in the past, they used to just give you a big thump on your head with uh, something, a block or a piece of wood, knock you out and then do whatever procedure they used to do. Then some brilliant man discovered uh, this liquid, which when you poured onto a sponge and put it on your face, you would inhale it and then you would fall asleep, which was much better than being hit by the head, hit on the head. And then it went on to, uh, it was still difficult falling asleep with this sponge on your face. You will struggle quite a bit before you fall asleep. And then also you can't control how much anesthetic is in that sponge. It just keeps pouring and you keep breathing. And when you're waking up, you pour some more, you know, measuring nothing. So uh, they found a better way to put you to sleep, which was to give you something through your veins. So then we move to this man here holding a needle. Which, with which he injects you and then you fall asleep very nicely. He's also holding the laryngoscope, this, this, this contraption here, which he uses to put a tube through your mouth and into your lungs so that you can be put on the ventilator without, when you're not breathing. Then came signs and technological advances. And then now uh, you can put the patient to sleep 
your monitors are on, you can hear all the beeps, so you're comfortable, you can read a newspaper while you're doing a case. And then newspapers have essentially become extinct. Nobody's reading newspapers anymore. So now you're holding your cell phone while you are, you are giving your anesthetic. And then now with COVID, you have to cover every part of your face and you wonder how you are supposed to see to um, anesthetize your patient. So this is how we have evolved over time. And in the past, again, uh, you can see in this uh, picture here, this poor patient who is coming for some surgical procedure. They're holding this big jar, only God knows what is in it. They were putting alcohol, they were putting herbs, and then you, they force it down your throat so that you fall asleep before your head is worked. And then uh, you become unconscious. And somebody gives you some music on the side. But what strikes me is the environment in which the operation is going to be done. There's a cut here. There's some food, there's some flies around you. So there was no concept of asepsis in that time. So this is how far anesthesia has come. Now, when you are coming for, an, for a, a procedure, we put on a bed, nice clean surroundings. We are chatting with you. We just put this thing on your face before you can say, Jack, you are out. And before you can say, Jack, you're awake again. So we've made it all uh, very um, easy. Now, so anesthesia, what it is, is a, a state of controlled, temporary loss of sensation or awareness, which we induce for medical purposes. So when you're coming for a surgical procedure, you should not feel any pain. And you shouldn't know what they are doing. If we, in, even when you're awake, you shouldn't feel any pain. And when you are asleep, in your sleep, you shouldn't be aware of anything that is happening around you. And it is controlled. There is somebody in charge who is making sure that you are fine, you are safe, you are either deeply asleep or you are indeed not feeling anything. And it is temporary. So it is reversible. When we are done, you will wake up very easily. So the anesthesiologist gives the anesthesia and anesthetics are, the, are what we call the drugs that we give to induce the state of anesthesia. Um, now, the mystery. Sorry. Oh, come on. The mystery is that um, the anesthetized patients can be compared to a patient who is going on a trip, on a journey. Unfortunately, they don't know where they are going. They don't know what they are going to find there. They have no idea what is going to happen there. They have no idea whether they are coming back. And it is the anesthesiologist or anesthetist who steers the course of this journey. It is a big responsibility. And our ultimate goal is always a safe journey back to consciousness. Although that is not always uh, guaranteed. It is mostly guaranteed, but it's not always guaranteed. So to be able to carry out this huge responsibility, we have to know as much as possible about the person we are taking on the trip, about everything, we have to know everything about their body, everything about their systems, their heart, their lungs, their kidneys, how everything functions. And then we know, we make a plan on how we are going to embark on this trip, how we're going to take them where we have to take them to and how we're going to bring them back. So meticulous um, preparation is the key. For an anesthetist, you have to know your equipment. There's a lot of physics in there. You have to know how every piece of equipment you're using works. Because when it's not functioning properly, you do the troubleshooting before you call the medical engineers to come and help. And sometimes there is some critical equipment and you have to get it back uh, immediately. Otherwise, there'll be untoward uh, effects. You have to know the medications you are giving. Your pharmacology should be, uh, should be, good is not a, good, uh, a big enough, a good enough word. You should know it inside and out. Uh, how it works, how it is metabolized, how it is excreted, its half-life, um, its side effects and everything. And whether it has, when it is broken down in the body, whether the, the products are also active. Um, you should know all the techniques of uh, anesthesia. We say there are many ways of killing a cat. 
Uh, there are different ways you can approach a surgical operation, but you must choose that which matches the surgical procedure, that which matches the patient who is in front of you, and that which matches the resources that you have. And we are experts in resuscitation. You don't put anybody, take anybody on this journey if you cannot resuscitate them. And then you must monitor them meticulously. You pay attention to detail. You watch that monitor. You listen to those beeps. You understand what a change in beep means. You, you have to know everything. So essentially you have to be smart. Now, um, do we have to see our anesthesiologist before we come for surgery? Yes. It is very, very important. And what are the things that you have to let your anesthesiologist know and why? We want to know whether you have had any previous anesthesia, any previous exposure to anesthesia. Um, sometimes you ask somebody, have you ever had any anesthesia? They tell you no. Then you ask them, have you ever been admitted into a hospital? They said yes. Um, why were you admitted into a hospital? They'll tell you, I dislocated my shoulder. Oh, you did? Yes. Okay. Um, how did they put the shoulder back in? They said, oh, uh, they gave me something to make me sleep and then and they popped the shoulder back in. So you said, good. So when they gave you something to sleep, that's an anesthetic. Have you, how were you feeling? When you woke up, were you all right? Were you vomiting? Uh, were you dizzy? Did it take you a long time to wake up? So those are the kinds of complications that you will have to inform your anesthesiologist about why you had the surgery or why you had the anesthetic and then if there was anything that you were told happened for some people it takes forever to get them to wake up so when you're giving them a second one and you know that then you know how to alter your anesthetics or some investigations that you may have to do before because there are some conditions that uh, predispose a person to prolonged recovery it be a long time to wake up then you have to know whether they have coexisting diseases or the famous word comorbidities. Um, with the stress in life, most of us are hypertensive, diabetic, they are asthmatic, they're, there are a lot of sickle cell patients around, they may have uh, heart problems, some know about them, some don't. They may have uh, convulsions or epilepsy. They may have had a history of jaundice that shows that they have had some liver, liver impairment along the line or been exposed to some drugs that have caused that jaundice. So we ask about all these things and you must give us accurate information because that is going to be one of the things we will look at to decide the technique of anesthesia. In fact, whether to go ahead with the anesthetic at all. A lot of people think if they tell us these things, we will decide, no, you can't have the surgery, but that is not it. Um, maybe we only refuse surgery to one out of a hundred patients, but it just allows us to have, make a good and a safe plan for you. We need to know about any current medications that you are taking, because there are some medications that have to be stopped before you go for surgery. There are some that you can continue uh, during the, uh, your time in hospital for surgery. So we need to know. And there are some that interact with the medications that they are anesthetics, anesthetic drugs. So we have to know all of that so that we um, know what to stop. There are some that when we stop, we have to put you on alternatives so that you can still have their function, but not those particular uh, medications. We need to know whether you are allergic to any medications so that we can stay away from them. We need to know whether you drink alcohol. Whenever you ask people whether they drink alcohol, they think you're asking them whether they are drunkards. So the first answer is no. Then I say, okay, do you take a little something, as we say in our society, for you know, some appetite before you eat? Oh yes, a glass of wine, maybe every day, just one glass every day, and I'm like, good. So sometimes we know how to tease the information out of you. But asking you whether you drink alcohol or not, it doesn't, you know, we are not just here to judge, we are here to treat. So um, I'm a brandy woman myself, and so I, there's no problem at all. Um, we ask you whether you smoke. Um, 
smoking has a lot of effects on your lungs and other organ systems. So uh, depending on how much you smoke, you may have to stop for a while before we have the surgery. That is a very difficult thing when you're telling a patient to stop smoking. Um, it is like telling them you won't do surgery for them. You have to bear all those things in, in mind. It's going to be very difficult. Then for those who do illicit drugs, we need to know because pain management in these people is very difficult. Then you may wonder why we want to know whether why you have dentures in your mouth. I mean, what business is it of yours, whether I wear dentures or not? But we can, uh, when in the process of getting a tube in your mouth, we can dislocate those dentures. And if they go down uh, your, so your uh, esophagus and you swallow it, we have to put the surgery on hold and get those dentures out. And it's not easy. So we need to know. So that there are some who have dentures that are implanted, that you can't take them out. So that's fine. But if they are the ones that can come out, then we will advise that you take them out. Uh, but if we don't know, then we don't tell you to take them out. So you just let us know. As soon as we finish your surgery, we'll put your dentures right back in uh, for you. Then we have to examine, we have to examine you. Um, we'll just listen to your chest. The chest and the heart are the primary programs. We listen to your chest, make sure that your you know, when you breathe, we hear the sounds we want to hear. We know what we are looking for. We listen to your heartbeat. We look at the rate. We look at the rhythm. There's a particular rhythm that is normal. If it is abnormal, fine. How abnormal it is, is it? And then um, all that will not uh, put a hold on your surgery. It will just help us to be ready for you, to plan your, your trip for you. Then we assess your airway. Some patients will need um, yeah, uh, airway managed in one way or the other. We have all sorts of things that we put in your mouth to connect you to the ventilator. And uh, what we will put in there will depend on uh, the kind of airway, what uh, your dentition, the size of your tongue, what is in the back of your mouth. There is stuff that we are looking for over there. So when you come in, we ask you, open your mouth wide and say, ah. And when you do that, we can see everything we need. To see and when we don't see those things then we are we, we note it we document it and then we will know what alternatives to offer you then after all that we do some lab work and um, depending on the kind of patients if they are you know little kids who are healthy or young adults who are uh, very healthy no his, his history of any illness or anything then you don't need too much lab work on the other hand if they are young and healthy but they are coming for a major procedure, then you have to get uh, an extensive lab work done because you have to know the baseline of their kidney function, their liver function, and their coagulation, their hemoglobin, their, uh, whether they have enough blood or not. You have to have those. So if they're going to bleed a lot and you're expecting the blood loss to be more than 50% of their blood volume, then you have to be uh, sure what, what your baseline is so that you know when to top them up and all of that. So at the end of all, this, all these questions and examinations and lab work, we put it all together and we assess your fitness for surgery. Um, that will be whether to give you a green light, a yellow light or a red light. There are some who get red lights. The heart is so bad, uh, you don't think they will make it. And so uh, you have to tell them no, but for most, of the people for 99% of them. Uh, they are fine, but there are different degrees of fine. So we categorize them into very fit and then fit, but uh, with a systemic illness that is controlled with, with some hypertension that is very well controlled, diabetes that is very well controlled. But if you are hypertensive and you are diabetic, even if they are well controlled and you are obese, that's too many things. And so you go into another, too many things that are wrong. So you go into another category. And then if you are, you know, really struggling, dehydrated and emaciated and um, confused and all of that, but you have ruptured an appendix, it's dangerous. Uh, you are in, a, in the category of uh, not so fit, but we don't have a choice. And we don't have too much time to optimize you because that ruptured appendix is going to kill you in the next few minutes. So we look at all of these things and we decide uh, if it's an elective case, then we have time to optimize. 
By, what do I mean by optimization? We will, some people don't have enough blood, so we build your blood up. If it's something that can wait, you don't need a blood transfusion. Blood transfusion has complications. So if you don't need it, if there are other alternatives and we have time, we don't use that. And um, we will give you hemati or hematinics or blood tonics as we call them, and uh, things to boost your, your blood. If you're malnourished, when you're malnourished, your proteins are low, so we'll give you, send you to the dietitian, they will build up your proteins, and then uh, we'll go ahead. Um, if you're not breathing okay because you have a, a deformity of your spine, then we will let you do breathing exercises and optimize your breathing before we go. So there are all sorts of things that we do, but um, most people are fit to go uh, straight away. So looking at that, how fit you are, all the information you have given us, all the lab work we have done, then we determine the kind of anesthetic that you have been used, that we are going to use, and we discuss it with you. You are supposed to know what your anesthetist is going to do for you and understand and consent. It is very important that you consent. And you don't consent to something you do not understand. If you have any doubt about anything, you ask them questions. And uh, it is, we are obligated to answer those questions. So um, what are the features of a good anesthetic? Which anesthetic technique will be best for me? Um, what you should look for, something must, that must completely abolish pain. You must feel no pain. It must be completely reversible. It must be as safe as possible. And then also uh, on the side of the anesthetist, you think of how to provide good operating uh, conditions for the surgeon. If he's working in a place that has a, a huge muscle bulk, it's going to be difficult navigating his way to the surgery site. So you have to relax those muscles for him so that he can easily push them aside and then get where he's going. You must be able to uh, use a technique that can drop the blood pressures so that the patient doesn't bleed too much. If there's so much blood in his field of view, he doesn't see anything and it takes forever to operate. So we look at all of that and then um, the technique must be acceptable to the patient. Now, I put that last. Not that it's the least important. Patient comfort and patient's preference is very important, but safety is essential. We, um, we, uh, we come to the, these decisions or these conclusions, not just uh, on a whim, but it's looking at everything and looking at what is safe for you because if you don't want a muscle relaxant but you want the surgeon to work in a place where there's a huge muscle bulk it's going to take him forever to finish the surgery and with every hour that we are in there the risks are higher so uh, we will let you have a say but we will explain to you why what you want is not exactly a uh, uh, we can't give you the imported anesthesia that you want. Um, do you prefer local anesthesia and says, no, I'd rather have an imported one. In Africa, we like everything imported. We can't give you the imported one that you want. And you are welcome to look, to seek a second opinion. And nine times out of 10, you'll come back. You'll go, you get the same um, opinion. So safety is always first. So just a place to listen and try to understand. But for most people, once they understand, you break it down to the layman's terms, and then they understand the work with you. So there are many ways to put, in a, 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 to put a person to sleep. There are some people that when they take their shoes off, one whiff of that shoe and you will collapse and we can do whatever we want to do. But usually we don't go in that direction. We can, oh, why is this thing doing that? Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So we can have a local anesthetic. A local anesthetic is uh, can be used for uh, maybe for uh, if you have a small lump on your skin, and we want to take the lump out. I don't have to put you to sleep to have the lump taken out. Depending on the look, uh, the position, the location of the lump, we can just put a local anesthetic around it, numb the whole place, 
and quickly take the lamp out. It is safer, less risky, and uh, you can be up and you can go back home as soon as we are done. You don't even need an anesthesiologist for this. The surgeons usually uh, apply the local uh, the infiltration and then you're fine. Otherwise, uh, if you have, uh, you can do a regional anesthetic for that blocks a wider area. Okay, local anesthetic just blocks around the lesion, but a regional anesthetic blocks a wider area. So for operations below the, the, the belly button, you can do uh, give do a spinal anesthetic or an epidural anesthetic, which uh, just little tiny injections that we put in the back, in the spine, and then it numbs you from waist down. It gives very good muscle relaxation for the surgeon. So maybe on uh, yesterday we had a patient who had uh, fractured his um, the the thigh bone. I won't say femur. Otherwise, Evelyn will not will be upset with me. <laughs> we have fractured his thigh bone. And then, uh, so we numbed him from waist down and then we fixed the thigh bone. Spinal uh, and epidural anesthetics are very safe. You use my very small doses of the medications. Their side effects are really small compared to med the medications we use for general anesthetic. Uh, I'm not scaring you, but for general anesthesia, the, the medications we use for general anesthesia, they're the same medications that are used for when they are, uh, when the patients on death row uh, opt for lethal injection. It's just in smaller doses, but um, they are, they, they, if you don't need it, uh, and, and if you can escape the risk of that, why not? But, but and then for peripheral nerve blocks, we just block the nerves that supply the area where the surgery is going to be done. And so we just block those nerves. So the rest of your body is fine. For a regional anesthetic, you can we can sit down and have a good chat. Sometimes we sing with the patient. We can we can have a picture of a patient who's on her iPad while the hip replacement is going on. And it's very comfortable. Some people still want to sleep. So we put the spinal in. And then we sedate them with a bit of uh, propofol to just make them doze off. But you can tap them at any time and they wake up. Sometimes uh, they hear all this hammering and chiseling and they are a little uh, upset. So we just um, give them a little dose of propofol and they are fine. But as soon as the surgery is over and you turn the propofol off, they are up as if nothing happened. Then you can have a general anesthetic in which you, you lose consciousness, you don't feel any pain. And if they need a muscle relaxant, we add it as well. So we are totally knocked out. This is where you go on the journey and you have no idea where you're going, but you're just trusting somebody to, give, to take you there and bring you back. And it's one of the most vulnerable moments of your life. So you must be very comfortable with whoever is going to take you there. And the only way you can be comfortable is if they have answered all your questions and you have uh, an in-depth understanding of what they are going to do for you. You don't want an uh, anesthetist who is now going to look on Google Maps to find their way for the trip. So to choose an anesthetic plan, we have to look at a lot of things. You look at the positioning of the patient. Is he going to lie on his back? Is he going to lie on his side? Is he going to lie prone? If you're going to lie prone, then you have to sleep. Uh, you look at the site of surgery. You look at the surgical procedure and complexity. If you're going to do a surgical procedure that is going to take six to eight hours, then uh, you are better off being asleep. You can't lie in one place. You will disturb everybody. You'll be very uncomfortable and moving your arms all over the place. So estimated duration of surgery is there. The skill of the surgeon, of course, the surgeons have to learn. And some of them, even after learning, they are still slow, very, they take their time. So you should make sure that the anesthetic uh, lasts the entire period. If they are going to have a few, a lot of blood loss, then we prefer that you sleep because it's very, you can control things better that way. And then the, the, the fitness of the patients for uh, surgery. Um, if they are not very fit, you will want a technique that's disturbs their blood pressures and heart rates as little as possible. You want them to be in the same condition that they came to you in. So you have to choose a technique that doesn't disturb their physiology much. And then of course, is the patient's preference. 
sometimes it's in agreement with us and sometimes it's not. So we will, we will um, negotiate on that. So you have to give consent. You have to make sure you, you, you have to, like I said, discuss the uh, preparation. We tell you how many hours uh, before the surgery you can eat and what you can eat, which of your medications to hold, to withhold on the morning of surgery and which ones you, should, you can take. Uh, whether we will give you, we, we have this anxiolytic, we call it uh, an anxiolytic. Anxiolytic means you, 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 you kill anxiety. So it, 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 we give it to them and it takes away all the anxiety and they relax and they can sleep. Some of them might even asleep before they come to the uh, operating room. Then you discuss your techniques of anesthesia. We tell you about any anticipated complications and how we plan to manage these complications. We tell you about the risks involved and um, what we can do something about and what we cannot. We tell you about blood transfusion. If you will need it, you have to consent to that. We tell you about how we will manage your pain. We, I always tell my patients, I cannot take away all your pain after surgery. I could do that, but the, the dosages that I'll have to give you to do that will mean that you will not breathe, your blood pressures will crash, and then you will not be able to mobilize. You will not be able to move after surgery. So we are defeating the whole purpose. So we will give you so that we have a pain score, which is a score of from zero to 10. Zero means no pain at all. And 10 is the worst possible pain ever. We will try to keep you at about three so that the pain will be manageable. It will be there, but it will be very manageable and you will be comfortable and you'll be able to do your rehabilitation. And then you should feel free to ask any question that you want about your procedure and about your anesthetic te technique. We give you the, you have the right to do that. And so we'll let you do that. Once you have done, we have done all of that and you have given your consent, you sign a form, which we give you with all that we have spoken to you about, and then we proceed. Now, how safe are you during surgery? I uh, brought these pictures to show you that you are very safe. And this is thanks to science and technology. Um, when I was training as an anesthetist or as, as an anesthesiologist, I, we had to do manual blood pressures. So when you have a patient, every five minutes you take, I don't know how many people have seen a manual blood pressure cuff, but you put it, wrap it around the patient and you, you, you uh, squeeze and squeeze and squeeze, then you take your stethoscope, put it in your ear, and then you deflate. And as you deflate, you listen for your heart sounds. By the time you finish taking one, it's time for the next uh, one. Now everything is automated so that um, you just, at the start of surgery, once we have uh, venous, we put a, 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 we set a drip on you, as we say in Ghana, or we put an IV on you, we put our monitors on, so you have a blood pressure cuff on your arm, you have uh, EKG electrodes on your chest that will tell us, uh, let us hear your heart beating. So if you look at uh, this picture up here, the green says 61, his heart rate is 61. You can see how the heart is beating. This looks fine and normal. There are abnormal rhythms. And if we see that, then we can, we can recognize it very early and do something about it. In the past, it could be on the table. And before you know it, there's no pulse. There's no blood pressure. It's all gone. But now you can see everything as it happens. And this is your saturation. It tells us you have enough oxygen in your blood all the time. So you're fine. Now, if you look on the... At the picture on the right, you can see there's a lot of stuff being monitored here. And that will tell you that this is a complex case. So instead of putting the blood pressure cuff on the arm like we have here, you see the anesthesia machine is even off. There's nothing there because we gave them a spinal anesthetic. But we, we prepare the anesthesia machine just in case anything goes wrong and you have to put them on the machine. But the machine is off. So all we have is uh, EKG saturation, pulse oximeter, and a non we call it a non-invasive blood pressure. That means we are using the cuff on the arm. If you come to the one on the right, we have EKG all right, we have pulse oximeter all right, and we have this red line here. This means that we have actually put a needle into his radial artery, one of the arteries in the arm. So we want exact pressures moment by moment, 
pressures. Um, there is always a difference between the, the invasive blood pressure and the non-invasive one, which is the one you put on the arm. And we want accurate values because we are going to work on his spinal cord and you have to keep your mean pressure at a certain point. And you don't have the automated one reads every five minutes or every two minutes. You can't afford that. You want moment by moment blood pressures. And so you have to put in, do invasive blood pressure monitoring. And if you look here, you have a patient whose lungs are restricted. He's not breathing like you and I. So he takes in a little breath and the pressure in his chest is so high. So you have to be able to control how much, uh, put him on the ventilator, control how much air you're putting in there, watch your airway pressures, see whether they are rising. If they're going too far, too high, then you know there's something wrong. You check and you do whatever you have to do. So uh, you are very safe. You are monitored throughout. Uh, before you fall asleep, you have to make sure they have put all the monitors on you. If they haven't, to ask them, please, where are my monitors? And then they will put them on um, for you. We uh, have, science has enabled us to have blood conservation techniques. We have this machine here, which uh, collects blood from the uh, field, from the surgical field, puts it into this reservoir here. We wash it, there's some saline hanging here, we wash it and remove all the debris and all of that. And then the red cells are packaged and it's centrifuged in this machine here and it goes right back through this to the patient. So as we are taking from you, we are cleaning it, washing it up and then giving it back to the patient. So that makes you reduce how much of somebody else's blood you will have to give to the patient. In the past when we were doing these cases, we could give one patient five units of blood for this complex spine surgery, but now we only cost much two because we have a cell saver. Sometimes if the patient, patient has a good hemoglobin, a lot of um, rich blood, we can actually take some off at the start of surgery and hold it because it's very rich in platelets and clotting factors and, and hemoglobin. All these things are components of your blood. So we have nice, fresh blood, better than what we are getting from the blood bank and we hold it and then we give it back to you at the end so that your hemoglobin is not so low. We can actually, uh, monitor your spinal cord now. Th this guy in the corner there is monitoring the spinal cord. So when you're working on the spine, you are putting screws and rods in the spine and your spinal cord is this very sensitive structure. So he's monitoring it and making sure that impulses are moving up and down the spinal cord. As soon as he has a problem, he tells you, Jack, stop. It puts the red flag up and then you retrace your steps. Sometimes the blood pressure has dropped a little low. We raise the pressure. Is it okay? No. Then you have to backtrack. Take out whichever screw you, 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 you last put in or whichever rod you last put in. Is it back? Yes or no? Then we have to try steroids. Maybe the cord uh, is a little swollen. It's angry. So we give it some steroids to calm it down. And then he says, okay, I have something back and then we can go ahead. Sometimes we don't have anything, but we'll wake the patient up and, and then uh, they can move and then we are fine. And then we keep going. We'll put them back to sleep. That is all complex, but uh, it, most of the time we do very simple things as well. So this is a complex spine case. The patient is lying prone. He is, you can see his hands lying on pillows and you have to pad all pressure points because he's going to lay like this for seven hours. So you have to pad all pressure points. His eyes are padded. His tube, there's a tube in his mouth that is connected to the ventilator here. So he's not breathing at all. The ventilator is doing all the breathing for him. And we are monitoring all the rest of the breathing parameters here. And then um, we are giving him total intravenous anesthesia. So we are not using any gas apart from oxygen and air. The isoflurane, we have other gases which we use to put you to sleep. The oxygen doesn't put you to sleep. What puts you to sleep is these two here. There's isoflurane and there's sevoflurane. But that interferes with spinal cord monitoring. So we don't use that. We do total intravenous. So we have propofol here. I'm sure you all know propofol. That's what Michael Jackson overdosed and it made his exit. And then we have fentanyl here. We have tranexamic acid here, which is for to help the blood clots. If the blood doesn't clot, then you just keep 
bleeding. These are very uh, huge surgeries. We open them up right from the neck to the bum. So uh, there's a lot of bleeding. Then there's uh, something to control the blood pressures with over here to keep it in the range in which you want. So um, you are very safe. Technology has enabled us to uh, keep you very safe during surgery. We even monitor how much fluid we are giving you. We can count to the last drop, so we can set it to give 354 mils per hour or 287 mils per hour, and it will deliver exactly that. This is especially important when you're working in babies, day olds. They can only take maybe uh, if it's, um, maybe you can only give uh, maybe 30, mills of fluid at a time. So you have to be very, very um, careful. So um, you are very safe during uh, surgery. You may not require all of this, but whatever you require, there are some basic, basic standards. We have the EKG that uh, shows your pulse rate and your rhythm. We have the saturation, we have your non-invasive blood pressure, and then we have carbon dioxide, how much carbon dioxide produces. That is normal, basic standard. The rest is all um, as is needed. So this is my, the patient that we gave a spinal, you see he's sleeping, we are warming him, we have um, the bear hugger, so he's nice and warm because the theaters are cold. You see the surgeons wear all these uh, gowns and they are really warm under them. So we, the operating room theater is cold, so we warm the patients up. And he wanted, he was talking quite a bit and decided he wanted to sleep. So we just gave him a bit of propofol to knock him out and then um, not knock him out completely. He was breathing on his own, just a bit of oxygen, which is uh, as per protocol. And then um, we proceeded with him. This is a patient who is having a hip replacement and she, she was given a, a spinal anesthetic and she didn't want to sleep. She wants her iPad so she can watch a movie while she um, has her surgery done. So what happens when we are done with the surgery? We take you to the recovery ward and we continue monitoring you. Monitoring does not stop. So you have still have the EKG electrodes on your chest, your blood pressure cuff on your arm, your uh, saturation probe or oximeter on your finger. And if for those who are getting invasive monitoring, we'll continue all of that. And it does not stop until you are leaving the ICU or the recovery ward or the PACU, whichever one it is. We have to document everything. Every single move that is made on you is uh, documented. In this day of litigation, you, you have to, that is the only thing that can save you if there's a problem. Some will need some oxygen therapy. So sometimes you just need uh, some prongs to be put in your nose, very tiny prongs in your nose to give you low dose oxygen. Some need face masks, some need um, more sophisticated things. So whatever we need, is uh, whatever uh, we give you is, is tailored to your need. We have to watch your fluid therapy, how much fluid per hour we give you, um, when it's okay to start drinking, we start slowly, we could give you some ice cubes, you, you um, or some, a bit of water to drink. If you don't throw up, then you are fine. We give you some fruit juice. If you're okay, we can move up to some soup. If you're okay, then you can eat. Some people want to eat for food, right? As soon as they wake up. But we tell them, no, you have to be patient. Then we take care of your pain. As I said, um, we cannot take all of it away. Um, but some people wake up and they don't have any pain. But I don't like to promise my patients that I will take away their pain and they wake up and they are feeling something. Then I have failed them. So... And um, we use, we go from simple things to more complex things. So we give paracetamol. We actually start that during the surgery. We can give some, we give some morphine or if they are children, maybe a bit of fentanyl. But in fact, uh, the analgesia actually, the pain relief actually starts from inside the OR for the operating room because we can, we, we infiltrate when we finish the incision site, the incision site tends to be where the pain is the worst. So we infiltrate it with a local anesthetic. If it's um, spine surgery, we can put a bit of uh, morphine in the spine, you know, okay. And then we give paracetamol, there's morphine we can give IV. Some 
until you can you can you can drink and tolerate oral uh, juice or something we have to give it iv so we can give it uh, we give it hourly we perfuses with one of these perfuses until you are fine then we can go switch on to oral or morphine and oral paracetamol we can do uh, NSAIDs or, or things like bufen and diclofenac, toradol and then uh, sometimes some people are complex uh, they need a bit of uh, um, other things like antidepressants other other kinds of um, analgesics but those are the more the exception than the rules than the rule sorry then we do relevant laboratory investigations. You have lost some blood, your physiology has changed. So we make sure that all your organs are functioning fine, functioning fine. If you didn't bleed much, just the hemoglobin is fine. If you bled a lot, then we have to do your, check your kidneys, your, uh, and your, your clotting uh, mm -hmm. profile. And then, um, don't worry, I'll be done soon. And then um, we give antibiotics, which are start, actually started uh, during the operation. We give anti-vomiting medicine to everybody. We give anti-ulcer medication to everybody because you are coming on an empty stomach and it takes a while for some people to go back to eating. So we keep them on the anti-ulcer medications. Um, for the diabetics, we, they can't, uh, we, we do insulin by a sliding scale. Those who are hypertensive, we continue the anti-hypertensives. Those who need nebulizing, we do that. We do chest physiotherapy. As is needed. So it's actually tapered to your need. Then when do we discharge you from the recovery ward or the pack you? You have to be awake. You have to be alert. You have to know where you are. You have to know what day it is. You have to be able to tell the time. You have to be able to uh, recognize the people around you because you met them before. You must be breathing well. You shouldn't be pale. You shouldn't have lost uh, too much blood, you should have pink mucous membranes. Your oxygen saturation should be above 95%. So with the stuff that we look for, your blood pressure must be stable, you must be passing enough urine, your pain must be adequately controlled, you must be moving all your limbs after the spinal anesthetic. So we look for all of these, document all of them before we send you, and before we stop monitoring you and send you back to your ward or to your room. Um, what complications can you expect? Um, some, from a general anesthetic, um, some people wake up, they are cold, they are shivering, just like the fact that you are warming them, but we continue warming them in the ICU. Some may have a sore throat, especially when we have put a, a, a tube through your mouth to put you on the ventilator. A number of people vomit, despite the uh, anti-vomiting uh, medications, so you have to add a few more. Some have some muscle pain, especially if this drug called saxamethonium has been used, which I mean, we only use when it's really, really necessary. And some of them have that. For the elderly, uh, they tend to be confused and um, they, 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 it takes them a while to know where they are and they can pull out all their IVs and remove all their, um, their monitoring stuff and it is expected. So we actually, uh, look for it and we are ready for it when it happens um, you know elderly people even you don't you don't go about changing their rooms and their stuff because they know where everything is they have been functioning like that for years and then you take them not only out of their room into another room in the same house but you bring them into a whole different environment um, it's 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 not easy for them so that happens a lot to them for the spinal sometimes they have headaches um, so when it happens, um, then you keep them lying in bed, you keep them well hydrated, and um, after a while it gets um, better, I give them something for their pain. After a while it gets uh, better. Sometimes they need more sophisticated things to um, make it better. Okay, so essentially there is no mystery to anesthesia. There's nothing to be worried about, there's nothing to be afraid of, there's nothing that's uh, it's all based on sound scientific principles. And every case is planned regarding technique, drugs, equipment, anticipated complications, monitoring, and post-operative care. We are the gurus at resuscitation, so you don't have to um, worry about that. And anesthesia must always, uh, well, must as much as possible, 
be safe and we owe that to our patients. So that will bring me to the end of my presentation. We say that he who works with his hands is a surgeon, he who works with his mind is a physician, but he who works with his hands and his mind is an anesthetist or an anesthesiologist. Thank you very much. And I hope that you are awake and I haven't put you to sleep because that is what I do. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, is somebody there? Okay, raise your hand, yes. Yes, um, who's unmuting them? Okay. Are you there? Yes. Is everybody awake? Everybody's awake. We have so many questions for you. Did I inundate you? Did you understand? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, now where are the questions? Okay, so we have a few questions in the, in the chat session. Um, I think I'll just read them. Okay. Oh, we have two participants also raising their hands, so maybe we can take their questions and then we can take okay. the one. Who has raised the hand? Hi, Ali. Yes. Ali. Yeah. <laughs> Evening. Uh, I just uh, saw the uh, this the, the lecture series from one of my colleagues from that seven, Doctor Safo. Um, I'm Ali. Ali you... I'm, I'm a okay. And a thirty-seven military hospital. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Ali, I think your network is. Uh, can you type the question? Because I am having a problem. Hello, okay, so I, I have a question I want to ask. Or more yes, like something to find. Adds to that. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, who's the second person whose hand was raised? We have D Diana. Diana, yes, Diana. We'll take the next question from Mary. Ah, can I unshare my screen now? Yes, that was okay. 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 Yeah. All right, okay, yes, perfect. Mary Sophia, you can please ask your question. Okay, it looks like uh, everybody who is <laughs> are not ready or uh, are just not available at the moment. So okay, so um, we can I'll look at what is in there. Yeah. So I'll just take the first question. The first question is: Are there people who are resistant to resistant to anesthesia? That is what they think. I have had patients tell me, Doctor Ho, as for me, I don't sleep. Or I don't sleep. But everybody sleeps. <laughs> everybody sleeps. They may be allergic to something. So you just change the plan. But there's nobody that we cannot uh, anesthetize because they are resistant to it. Unless they don't want to be anesthetized, then in that case, they won't consent to the anesthesia. Yeah. Um, what is an elective case? Wait, are there people who are resistant to anesthesia? In books and movies, I see that patients are told to count while anesthesia is administered. Why is this so? Okay, uh, we do it in different ways. You are told to count because um, maybe they'll say count down from 10. And while you are counting, they are giving you the, the anesthetic. So by the time you get to eight, seven, six, then you start falling asleep. You, you hardly ever get to zero. So it's just a way to take your mind off what is going on. What I do at Focus is that we all sing. I tell the patient, when you're coming, come with your favorite song. So when we're about to start, then we say, okay, let's go. Then we start singing. We have sung everything. We sing hymns. We sing Bob Marley songs. 
we sing the national anthem, we sing the Achimoto school song, and you see they sleep with a smile on their face. So it's just to distract them from what is um, happening. You can do it in different ways, not only um, count. Then somebody wants to know, someone caught it, wants to know what an elective case is. An elective case is a case that is not an emergency. It is a case that you, 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 can, you have time. You can wait, you don't have to do it immediately. And so you can wait to prepare or you can, you, maybe the patient is not ready yet. Some will tell you, I have a funeral in two weeks. I want to go for the funeral and come back. And that's fine. If it's an elective case, it can wait. But if it is an emergency, then you don't have time. Um, then uh, we have to go now or maybe in the next day or two. So that's an emergency. Elective case is a case that can wait. Um, is it really challenging having people's lives in your hands? Where is it? Yes. It is a huge responsibility. It is a huge responsibility. But uh, you, 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 you just, um, you always give it your best shot. And you, you, you have to be smart. You have to think. You have to be quick on your feet. Your reflexes have to be brisk. You, you train. You train to do it. And um, usually you, 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 you go with the aim of finishing, bringing it to a successful and meeting the ultimate goal of bringing the patient back as much as depends on you. But it, it is a huge responsibility. I, I, I don't like the word challenge. These days, everybody uses the word challenge anyhow. It's a huge responsibility, but it is something that we do all the time. Um, somebody says, it's important to consent. Yes, consent is, is very important. This is your life. So you must, you must um, understand and give us permission. Consenting is giving us permission to go ahead. We won't go ahead without your permission. Uh, what else? Um, let me see. How, wait. Uh, does that mean that anesthetics used on death row patients could be reversible? No, the doses they use are irreversible. There, you are not going to come back. So the doses they use there are not, the amount of potassium that is in there will stop your heart at once. By the time you try to get it back, uh, in fact, you can't. Um, where is it? Uh, how rare is it to have, sorry. Oh, um, I'm trying to, so just a sec, just a sec. Um, how rare is it to have someone with excess HB that can be stored? Oh, it's not that rare. There are uh, people with HBs of 15 and, and 16. We do it quite a bit. Anybody with HB more than 12, we can take some to put it down. It's, it's in fact, it's fairly common. Um, how, safe how, is how safe is bloodless surgery? What do you mean blood? You mean surgery where we don't give blood? Um, Iboku. We can, we, we do some surgery, some, not all surgeries need blood. But the patients will bleed. As for the patients, you, but once we cut, there'll be some blood, but we can control how much blood they lose. But we don't always give uh, patient's blood, no. There's quite strict criteria for giving um, blood. Um, question, Ali, Ali, what happens? Ali has typed his question. Uh, can I read it for you? Uh, well, yes, please. So he says, he's saying that what's your take on the use of opioids um, following spinal... Opioids. Yeah, following uh, spinal anesthesia. Um, with, uh, now he's using all the medical terms that we're trying to avoid. With intrathecal morphine, the anesthesia team always dissuades uh, surgeons from using opioids following their 
intrathecal morphine for the first 24 hours. Oh, no, morphine. it is when, if you, if you are going to use morphine, it, or I use morphine for almost all my spinals, it is when you are doing obstetrics anesthesia for pregnant women. When you're anesthetizing pregnant women, you can't put opioids in there because it will depress the child, it will uh, uh, interfere with the child's breathing. But for um, normal, other normal cases, you can. It just, it gives you a longer period for, or, or, of anesthesia. So if you want your, your, I can use putting enough morphine to give me six hours of um, surgery time. But all of it is tailored. If I need only two hours, then I know how much to put. But it must be preservative-free morphine. There must be no preservative in the morphine. So you must have preservative-free morphine. Or dimorphine, we call it. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is, in cases of um, emergency surgery, for instance, mm -hmm. from gunshots wounds and all that, how are you able to take like the details of the patient and like observe protocol? Exactly. So uh, in emergency situations, the dynamics change. Uh, you have to do a lot of things at the same time. If the patient came with somebody who knows them, uh, if the patient is conscious, they can give you some information. If they are not, and they came in with somebody who knows them, they can give you some information. If they were found somewhere and brought rushed to the hospital and there is nobody to give you the information, then you don't have it, but you proceed as cautiously as you can until you can get it. So that is, emergency gives you the leeway to proceed without knowing enough. But um, elective does not. So if it's an emergency, then you have the leeway, but you have to try at least and get something and assume the worst and then go ahead. But the, be ready for complications because you are going essentially blind. So you are ready for uh, whatever complications may, may happen. Um, it's not going. Can I move this then? There's one question here. I don't know if you've said this right. already. Um, somebody's asking that what happens the body if you drink immediately after surgery? My great grandmother died from drinking water right after surgery. Um, when when somebody dies right after surgery, uh, it may be from, I, I doubt, it may not be from the water, but if it is, there's something we call aspiration. Um, you drink and instead of it going into your stomach, it goes into your lungs, okay? But water per se in your lungs uh, will not kill you. You can drink the water sometimes, for when people are in the last stages of life, they ask for water because the, the, the changes taking um, place in them at that time make them thirsty. Thirst is one of the signs. And they will ask, I remember I told the patient, I'm not giving you water because I could see she was going. And I told her, I'm not giving you water. I was just pushing the fluids. I told them, I'm pushing as much as, I, as you need. So um, whether it was from the water, I don't know, but we go very slowly because you have to drink and not vomit. If you vomit, you can aspirate it. Because you are, although you are awake, your reflexes take a while to go back to normal in your throat. As long as you are awake, you won't aspirate. Unless you are a man and you see a beautiful woman and then the food goes down the wrong way. That is allowed. <laughs> that is allowed. But um, it takes a while. So we go very slowly. We give you water. If you aspirate water, nothing much, nothing will happen to you. But if you aspirate soup, the lungs are sterile. There's, there are no germs there. So when soup goes there, what it does is it causes, a, it's not even a bacteria, it's a chemical pneumonia. Things go there that shouldn't be there. So they actually like burn 
the land. So food is problematic, but water is not, but we don't want anybody aspirating water anyway. So we just give you a drop, a little bit, a teaspoonful to drink and we watch for a while. If you don't throw up, then we'll give you maybe half a cup. Then we watch. If you don't throw up, then we can give you a full cup. Okay. Um, what are the basic, but your grandmother could have died from anything else, something else. I am um, not apart from the water. It just happened, she just happened to ask for water at the time, yes. What are the basic parameters for an anesthetist to opt for vaporizers during, uh, oh, well, during various procedures? Well, um, you can use what you have, okay? But there are some procedures like the spine case that we were doing that you cannot use the vaporizers because they will interfere with our monitoring of the spinal cord. And now that's the way that we are working, the work going on around that spinal cord is dangerous. So we cannot work, we should be able to monitor it at all times. So if you put your isofluorine on and it's going to disturb the monitoring, then we'll put it off. There are other alternatives. That is why we do the total intravenous anesthesia. But um, you can, if, if you don't, if you don't have propofol, you don't have a choice, then you can't actually do that kind of uh, case. But you can do other cases. There are so many other cases that you don't need, that you, you, you don't need propofol uh, for. So one, what you have, two, the kind of case and the kind of monitoring that you need. And then um, civil, the choice, we don't even have deaths in Ghana. So that's not a, a problem. Civil fluorine is uh, very expensive. So you use, where we use it for children, or if the patient is very ill. Isofluorine is fine. Halothane is a thing of the past. We use civil fluorine instead of halothane. But if you don't have civil fluorine because it's expensive, you can use halothane. There's nothing stopping you. And fluorine, I haven't seen and fluorine in a long time. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so they were listening. Nice. When I see questions, then I know that I didn't put you to sleep. I didn't do my thing. <laughs> How much pain will the patient feel on the scale of one to 10 if the anesthesia is such that they can be awake and watch movies during the surgery? So the, 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 the pain is zero because you have put the spinal into the back. You have numbed them from waist down so they can't feel anything from waist down. So they are fine. They are pain-free, but it will wear off. And when it wears off, then you begin to feel the pain. So at that point, when the spinal is still in, it's zero. The pain score is zero. But that is during the procedure. Usually by the, usually by the time we are finishing, it's beginning to uh, wear off. Yeah. Um, how important is ABG test in pre and post operative procedures for an anesthetist? Um, there must be indication for ABG test. ABG test is not used for anybody. ABG test is only used for somebody who you think has a problem with um, either uh, oxygen or CO2 or ca carbon dioxide, sorry. So if you have a patient with restricted, whose lungs are not functioning well, so he cannot take in enough oxygen and the ox when he breathes out, the amount of air coming out is too small. So not enough carbon dioxide is coming out. You know, we breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a byproduct of metabolism everywhere in the body. So you must breathe it out very well. For those who cannot breathe well, they, they are, their breaths are very shallow. They retain the carbon dioxide and it changes the pH, the acidity of your blood. And the, you know, there are so many enzyme systems needed for metabolism, a lot of cellular activity, activity of cells in the body. All these things work at an optimum pH. It must be 7.4 or 7.41 or 7.39. There's a very narrow range in which they function. So once you change the acidity, it affects all other organs, systems in your body. So ABG is used for people who have uh, breathing problems or lung uh, disease and then um, and these spinal deformity um, patients. Um, yeah, people who are not breathing well. Okay. Um, 
sorry, trying to explain this in English is difficult. <laughs> so I keep using a few words. Um, what else? Sorry, um, I mean the use of opioids for pain. What is it? Um, for pain relief in a patient who has received intrathecal morphine. Or you wait for the morphine to wear off. You wait for them to start. Once you've given IT morphine, intrathecal morphine, that's morphine into the spinal cord. You have to wait for the morphine to wear off. And then you start. You can give your paracetamol all right. We give the paracetamol all right. But you must wait for the morphine, IT morphine to wear off before you can start uh, IV morphine. Otherwise, you will have an overdose. The risk of an overdose is high. Um, what happens to the patient when the machine for monitoring all parameters develops a fault during surgery? That is when you go back to the old days while you are waiting for them to bring a new machine. So when I started as an anesthetist, I told you, we had manual BP cups. Uh, we did not have saturation probes. That will tell you how much oxygen the patient has in the blood. So uh, occasionally you just look at the lip. Is it blue? No, it's nice and pink. That's fine. You look at the nail beds. It's nice and pink. That's fine. And then you you <laughs> you keep uh, going until you get a new uh, machine. Now you 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 actually use your watch and your fingers. To, you manually count the heart rate, and you do that until you get a new uh, a machine to replace what you have. And you make sure that you are giving them enough oxygen. Oxygen is the key. They are getting enough oxygen and your airway is controlled while you are waiting for a new machine to come in. Um, hi, Vishal. <laughs> um, wait, let me see. What are the bodily changes that happen? Oh, <laughs> oh when they are near death. Your systems are shutting down. There's a last um, sympathetic drive to keep you alive, okay? And so you, you begin to feel all those things. We'll go, that would be, take us into physiology and away from anesthesia. Um, I had an epidural for my cesarean and it was, Sorry, just a sec. Uh, and it was a very weird feeling. Yes, it is. I had one too. And every time they touched my toes, I felt like I had an electric shock. And there was this doctor who was just playing with my toes. She didn't realize what she was doing. And I kept telling her, stop it, stop it, because she was shocking me with electricity. But not everybody feels, um, everybody feels uh, that, yes. It's, it's, it, it's very weird. You don't feel your legs and you wonder where, they, where are they? I agree with you, it's a very weird feeling. Um, thank you, Vishal. Is anybody else? Okay, I think I've asked, answered all the questions here. Is everybody okay? Yeah, thank you so much. Hi, Miss Evie. <laughs> Hi, Rini. I, I think I was the one commenting about the uh, epidural because I had a epidural for my C-section. And like I said, mm -hmm. you, were, you were trying to explain what was happening because of the lady watching the screen while she was being operated on. Yes. And, and yes. I know yes. my, uh, one of the doctors, I had quite a few doctors because obviously it was a C-section, there was different mm -hmm. doctors in there, explaining to me that it feels a bit like they're rifling in a handbag. <laughs> and it's very much that feeling. It's, you can feel the movement, but you can't feel Yes, you can any feel pain. movement. You, yes. you can feel movement, but you don't feel pain. Yes. And I mean, it's, it like I said, it's, it's very unsettling because you, yes. they've cut you open after all. So you expect to be feeling something, but you don't. You just kind of feel... Yes, you don't. But you can feel the movement. A lot of yeah. shuffling. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Agreed. <laughs> Okay. Does a typical team in the operating room consist of? Okay. Does it differ depending on the type of anesthesia? Um, a little. Or not the type of anesthesia, it's the type of surgery. So you always have uh, surgeons. You have a surgeon and his assistant. 
you have the, uh, the nurse who scrubs in, and then you have a circulating nurse who picks this and that for the scrub nurse. You have the anesthesiologist and the assistants, and then we have um, anesthetic techs who also picks this and that for us. And then um, depending on what else you need, if it's for the spine, we have the uh, spinal cord, the one doing the spinal cord monitoring there. But a typical team is the surgeon, his assistant, the scrub uh, tech, the circulating nurse, and the anesthetist. Basic five. You can build on that um, depending on the, the complexity of the case. Sometimes you have two scrub nurses and you have four surgeons, then that tells you that there's Wahala. <laughs> and two, there are some cases that you need two anesthetists for because the patient is very ill and it's coming for a complex procedure. So you need two consultants, it's not even a consultant and a senior resident, you need two consultants. Yes, so you have to be able to de determine all of that before the surgery and plan for it. Um, okay, I think that's the last. Is there any more? Okay. Thank you all very much for your attention. It has been a pleasure. And uh, I hope to come your way again soon with something else. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Renu. Uh, it's been such a great time having you. I'm sure you learned a lot. And I, I learned a whole lot. Um, I think we can officially end the meeting now.